Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Project Management Institute Montgomery County Chapter Monthly Meeting for the month of April. Uh, it's good to see everybody in the room and a healthy matching audience on Zoom. Uh, we do realize that uh, the first Wednesday of the month tonight fell on the first night of Passover as the sun goes down. So we wish everyone who celebrates uh, a happy Passover. We apologize for the scheduling conflict. Uh, in the last seven months, there's been two Jewish holidays that have fallen on the first Wednesday of the month when that hadn't happened in like the last 11 years. So. <laughs> but uh, we post these presentations on our YouTube channel for on-demand access, and I'll ensure this is posted uh, first thing tomorrow morning at the latest. But happy Passover to all, and for those who celebrate Easter over the weekend, uh, happy Easter holidays. Our chapter scholarship program closed at last week, uh, and we'll now draw the winners. Uh, Mr. Jim Steckel, uh, exhaustive. A lot of efforts to work with all the guidance counselors in the Montgomery County area and uh, for members who live in the Frederick County line. Uh, we also accepted applications for them. Uh, we did increase the chapter dollar amounts from $1,000 a piece to $1,500. Uh, so uh, every dollar counts with higher education these days. And hopefully, we, an extra $500 can at least buy another book or two. Uh, in the spirit of being honest brokers, we're having our uh, co-presenters draw names. Hi, folks. Uh, um, yeah. If I can. <clears throat> I'll be brief. Uh, each year we do this. It's our little community outreach thing. We have two $1,500 checks that we will give to students who have submitted an application, passed a 10-part quiz, and get their names drawn tonight. What we're actually going to draw are numbers. I have a list of names that correspond to the numbers, and we don't want to give out names until we have the person's uh, permission. So they sign a form afterwards and also give us permission to put their likeness and uh, name on our website so everyone can see who they are. Uh, we have a short number this year, only seven. One of those is from a non-member related person. Six of them are from members in this chapter. Congratulations. And one of the things they have to say is that they have a GPA above a certain number and um, these are high quality folks, every one of them. They take the time to get involved in it, pass the quiz, get to look up some things. And um, I'm thrilled with any amount that we get, but it's, it's very satisfying to do this every year. So our two speakers tonight, Nick and Brandon are going to assist. 
uh, they already got the ball set up. And so, yeah, what are we doing, you don't have to do this one. No. <laughs> what happens is we have one person that was not a member's relative. And so we're going to choose from the six members. And then those that were not chosen get put into the open category for a second chance. So, yeah, don't look at the number. It is number four. Number four. I'll tell you the high school that that relates to. <laughs> that was a spot. I mean, I heard four. I turned me out. I heard seven. All of them. There were seven to begin with. So one's already answered. Number four was from Winston Churchill High School. A member's son. Number two. Number two. I don't have. No, it's second pitch. It is number six. And that is person from Walter Johnson High School. There was only one choice from Walter Johnson High School. <laughs> so the person who's related to the person's uh, name that we just chose knows who it is. <laughs> but I still go through the counselors. I don't just call up the kids and say, hey, this I go through the counselors so the counselor knows they tell the person and they can run home and tell mom and dad. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll talk to you again next year. <laughs> and we'll make our best effort to be at the High school still post COVID have the scholarship assembly where representatives from the organization uh, present the scholarship, shake the hand up on the stage. So, like, that's a good Kodak moment for the chapter. So, stay tuned on the newsletter for that. Uh, friends of our chapters from Leadership Technique, uh, at least with Hammer and David Newman, uh, wrote a book late last year called The Engagement Matrix that really focuses on. Uh, decision making uh, quickly in the heat of the moment uh, while you're engaged uh, for program and project managers of all levels and experience. Uh, it's $20 on Amazon for a paperback that can be delivered within a few days, and it's also free to all Amazon Kindle Unlimited subscribers who pay the $5 to have access to all the titles that are considered Kindle Unlimited, so, which is a good value. As, Somebody subscribes. So just a cheap plug there. Uh, training at uh, the University of Maryland Project Management Center of Excellence, which was one of the few uh, Division I universities that have the Center of Excellence for Project Management. Uh, they have their annual symposium later on this month. Uh, virtual offerings uh, in person and hybrid, uh, a little bit pricey, but if your company or agency gives an annual education allowance. This is a good opportunity to knock out a lot of PDUs. Uh, some good projects for those who have been doing NAS game over the weekend or this week, uh, the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge with, with the three arches. Uh, there'll be a presentation on how that project went and all the years and fighting it took to uh, commemorate, commemorate uh, Mr. Douglass's legacy there. So a lot of good presentations. Uh, we'll have this in our newsletter for the next uh, few weeks leading up to it. And there is an in-person registration that's a higher dollar value if you don't get the ambition to go or don't get the approval to go until like the day before. Uh, PMI Global is offering their virtual training series for the month, even for those who participated in uh, the March virtual experience, that was free. Uh, this isn't free. Uh, all day training sessions range from $500 to a little more than 2000 
but a good opportunity to really deep dive into topics that interest you. Uh, so stay tuned for that as well. And that's the same week as the symposium, but the Monday and Tuesday. Book. Uh, we have representation from our Toastmasters group here. Uh, at the second and fourth Wednesdays, uh, virtually, uh, they get together. Uh, it's, we're never perfect public speakers. Uh, we can always get better. We can always learn from each other. So a uh, good opportunity if you've never been in a Toastmasters group to uh, start uh, honing your public speaking skills. If you've done one in the past and you need to pick back up, uh, depending on how many years absent, you can pick back up on the manual with what speech you're on and a great opportunity to meet your fellow uh, chapter members. And uh, our Toastmasters president's here in the house, so she'll give a little supporting information. Yeah. One update is we don't have the manuals anymore. It's all online. Oh. Yeah, so you can go at your own pace and it's like a self-service. So when you become a member, there are different tasks. I'm working on leadership development. There could be, what is it? The, yeah, and engaging humor. How do you make speeches with, you know, you want to imbue that with a bit of humor. One of the things for Toastmasters I want to share with each and all of you is that other than just being able to facilitate meetings and to give polished speeches and being able to go to conferences and be able to speak confidently about the topics that you have in mind, one of the best things I've done out of Toastmasters is to be able to communicate with people better. And it's just not in your workspace with your coworkers or your colleagues. It's actually helped me communicate better with my family handle conflict a little bit better. There's so many things that you get out of Toastmasters that you don't even realize. So I highly encourage each and every one of you to find me and I'll give you one of these little cards that will give you information on the next Toastmasters meeting. And we are doing more in-person events. So if you just didn't want to be bored with Zoom meetings any longer, definitely keep us in mind. And I have Supreet here. You may want to share a few other things. Sure, so kind of carrying on with um, what Sue said, um, one of the other things that our uh, club is um, has a little bit of an advantage if you are a, um, a PMI member and you become a club member with our club, we also give out PDUs per meeting. So we have in a month, you can get three PDUs and in about the span of a year, that's about like 30 plus PDUs. So half the um, number of PDUs you need for um, reaccreditation. So if anyone's interested, um, please come see Sue and myself. That's right. We all need our re recertification every three years, right? So just come to the meeting and get some of that. So that's kind of just a count towards your recertification. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, as we kick off the screen, our education partners are all doing great things. Uh, stay tuned to our chapter website for uh, their events that are both in person and hybrid. Uh, we have some representation from the PMI Baltimore chapter, uh, their local Frederick, Maryland group. Uh, for those who live that way, we'll be starting uh, in person events uh, later on in the summer with. Carla Pritchard, the guru of risk management, uh, set to kick off. So uh, we'll market that on our newsletter as well. Okay, so it's a great privilege and pleasure to have Mr. Brandon Jones and Mr. Uh, Nick Duchesne from ThruLine here. Uh, ThruLine, since 2005, has been providing uh, design thinking and uh, outside the box human centered design services to. Uh, hybrid of uh, government clients and Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jones is also the former principal deputy CIO of the Naval Navy Facilities Engineering Systems Command, NAFAC. Uh, my first job out of active duty in the Marine Corps when I was a young and dumb contractor, uh, I had to ask uh, Mr. Jones for some favors for his services and 
15 years later, I can't claim young anymore. I'm still dumb and I'm <laughs> asking him for favors to uh, donate his uh, time, expertise, and preparation uh, for this chapter. So we're glad he's here. Uh, he's been a PMP since 2017. Yep. And this is his first PMI meeting, regardless of global or chapter affiliation. So we want to make a good impression of what PMI is. And we thank him and Nick and looking forward to a good hour of enlightenment on what design thinking is and how it can uh, really enhance what we used to call the project planning phase uh, for a project. So welcome. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, everybody. Um, Brandon Jones, Nick Duchesne here. Uh, from Throughline, the CEO, Nick's our uh, head of growth. And uh, got, it, got, it. got it now? We're good to go. All right. Um, so, first, let me say uh, I love the fact that y'all have PMI as well as Toastmasters together. So, I'm a Toastmasters competent communicator. And I love the fact that you're bridging the gap because, you know, time is our most valuable resource. and trying to go to this meeting and that meeting. I had a chapter meeting at the Navy Yard for Toastmasters and then PMI meetings were downtown DC. It's just a lot, but loving the fact that y'all have kind of brought those together. Um, before we get into design thinking, I want this to be a collaborative, uh, energetic kind of talk tonight, late evening. You're spending your time out here. I'll give you a little bit about my background. Uh, started my career with electronic data systems, EDS. First job out of college working in the Pentagon for the Navy Marine Corps Intranet. Um, spent five years there, uh, five years there, then went to the Navy Yard to be a site delivery manager. Did some sales, then moved into the federal government, the Naval Facilities Engineering Command, uh, where I was the principal deputy CIO and acting CIO for seven years. And then did a stint at PwC as a director for the Navy cybersecurity account. Then did a nonprofit CIO gig at WEPA uh, for all you federal employees. Uh, you have Begley Life Insurance. WEPA is the alternative. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. It's a great organization. You should look at. You should look at. <laughs> now I'm the CEO of Throughline, <laughs> um, and I've been a client of Throughline, a board member of Throughline, and now have the pleasure to serve as the CEO of Throughline. So we're going to go through some examples, some real life examples. I'm going to give you a real life example where I was a client to kind of think about design thinking in a different way that's going to bring impact. It could get you budgets. It could align resources. It could help you work within your colleagues across the aisle. Um, so all of those things and just a different way of thinking about things from a human centered design perspective uh, and just new ways of working. So Nick, I'll pass it over to you. I should have gone first. My resume is way shorter, um, slightly less impressive, but um, I've been with Throughline for about 10 years, um, and I'm a program manager and lead our, our growth and, and business development here, and we're uh, we're based down in Washington, D.C., um, and I like to say we're a bit of a hybrid of a company. Half of our colleagues are more the traditional contractor or consulting type, you know, working on strategy, working on technical implementations. The other half of our company is a full service design agency. So I work with a ton of animators, illustrators, graphic designers, uh, and creatives. So our general philosophy as a company and kind of how we work is if you're dealing with complex subjects or working within complex environments, uh, communicating visually is the best way to do so. It's a great way to lower the barrier to, of entry to understanding something without having to simplify it to the point that you lose all the value um, and the nuance that's there. And these are hallmarks of the uh, design thinking process, but working very iteratively and co-creatively with you know our clients and our colleagues um, as we go through this. So we'll show a little bit of this today, and I'll, I'll dive in a little bit now to what what is design thinking? And you have no idea how long multiple creatives can sit around and debate that question with each other um, after work. Uh, what is design thinking? What are the differences between that and design strategy and human-centered design? I've heard many uh, long debates over it, but a good way to think about it um, 
for the crowd here tonight and as as we apply it to, to you know our careers and our jobs and, and the projects we're working on is you can think about it as an approach the way to you know kind of approach solving a problem um, you can think about it as a process there are steps to go through it does tend to be a little bit more cyclical than a, a straightly linear process but there are steps that are followed but most importantly it's a way of thinking and the way that i like to kind of describe it is that it's taking the creative process um, and applying it less to the creation of something visual or something musical or something purely artistic and instead applying that creative process to problem solving um, and you know approaching a very complex problem with a creative and design centric um, means. So there's some different stages of the design thinking process and we'll kind of map out how these align to different uh, phases of the project management approach, how they align to different types of projects. But really what it comes down to is, is starting with empathy um, for the end user, the end recipient of whatever it is you're doing, then working to define how might we, is a key question in the design thinking and design strategy world, how, how might we approach this? How might we structure this? Coming up with a bunch of ideas and ideating, kind of not taking nothing off the table up front, and then running through, you know, a cycle of prototyping and testing of various solutions, whether that solution is technology, whether it's messaging, whether it's a new process or a new approach. The way that we apply this um, in our work is um, through our different phases of explore and vision and execute, where when we go to our clients and projects, uh, this is how we approach, approach our work. First, it's to help you know figure out what is going on with the user community, whoever that is. Um, and there, that can be research centric, that can be conversation centric, but can take a lot of different forms. Then in Envision, it's it's trying to figure out, okay, what is a potential path forward? If we know where our destination is uh, and we've done the cartography to figure out the landscape, what's the path? What's the navigation forward? And then Execute is, is moving along that path. And as a company, we really focus on kind of four key milestones, define it, figuring out intent. What is it that the leader or the, the stakeholder is trying to do? Moving on to definition of how are we going to kind of solve that? That's the explore phase. Going through activation, designing a solution, figuring out what it may be, and then in the execute phase, moving towards that impact. Along the way, the reason we're called Throughline as a company is it's key to kind of have, especially in a creative and cyclical approach, it's really key to always keep in mind where the North Star is, where you're going towards. Um, and setting that kind of core vision of what you're moving towards, as you'll see in some examples of our work, is essential when the exact steps there, the exact pathway there may not always be fully defined, may not always be able to be followed for long periods of time, but ensuring that you know you're going in the right general direction and aligning people around that is essential. So I'll toss back to Brandon here to talk a little bit about how we uh, took this approach to, to him when he was over at NAPFAC. So I know there's uh, some contractors, there's some federal civilians, uh, quasi-government in the room today. So I'm at the time the principal deputy CIO at the Naval Facilities Engineering Command. And the problem that I have is I've done the data center consolidation. I've got 32 defense business systems. I've got a $150 million budget that I'm running. But... Oh, by the way, because I'm the facilities engineering CIO, the meters on every building is now connected to Wi-Fi. The building control systems are now connected to Wi-Fi. And the industrial control systems that I have are now connected to the internet and nobody's looking at those. None of them have to go through a risk management framework process and I've got 87,000 buildings, 52,000 structures, and 21,000 linear structures to worry about. So, and I'm not funded to do any of this at all. So it's like, okay, now I've got a mandate to go fix this. This is part of your job. I have no funding and I have no staff to do. So I needed something and I didn't even know what I needed at the time as a client. And through line. So what Nick just mentioned from a through line perspective, what's our process? Ex uh, explore, envision, execute. I went to our studio in DC now uh, with four of my 15s and three contractor staff. 
to figure out what the problem actually was. And we do this process where you have a graphic recorder. And this was our three hour conversation on a huge poster board of how we get there, what are the threats in the landscapes, what's the current state, what's the architecture, and then how do we get to the end state? So I've got this huge poster about the size of this wall here, the entire wall with this mirror. So I take this back to my office and I, I find the biggest wall in the, in the, in the Washington Navy Yard, building 33, second floor, to put this on because every time somebody walked by it, they were like, what's this? And then they start studying and I start communicating the problem. I go, oh, wow, that is an issue. So now it's, now it's a conversation starter. My two-star Admiral Kate Gregory at the time came by and said, Brandon, what is this? And I walked her through the entire process. She was like, we need to do something about this. Yes, ma'am, we do. <laughs> uh, so now imagine, this is the explore phase. So now I need something visual that's easily condensable. If you've ever had a brief in the Pentagon or I'm sure whatever federal agencies, whenever you take it up to the executive level, like no more than three things. If you can draw with crayons, please do that. But I need it to be simple so I can digest it and understand where it's going. So this is the final output. And this happened in five months time. So this is the Ashore Cyber Framework map. It is the first thing in my life and career that ever went viral. Like I briefed it literally across the board to help folks understand what the challenge was. So everything from the total landscape, so I told you 87,000 buildings, 52,000 structures, 21,000 linear structures. Here are all the policies and mandates that we have to follow. These, this is a defense in depth. So we had a systems command, Spay War at the time, now Nav War, who's in charge of IT. So we had to follow their process. We were following their process. NAFAC as a systems command has technical authority areas. Here are our six. This is why we have to do this. So just reminding people what that is. RMF, six steps, risk management framework. Uh, I had already devised a plan of how we would do it. The bottom uh, right there is the eight steps to cyber secure all of the facilities. The bottom piece, two pieces, the difference between IT and OT, it's, it's, it's huge. So you can't just take a system developer of a business system and then go say, go run this data system. The skill sets and competencies are totally different. So we need to bridge that gap. In the Pentagon, they were doing this task force cyber awakening. TIFCA was the acronym, trying to weigh, raise cyber awareness across ships, air, logistics, but they forgot about facilities. So I kind of raised their awareness now. There's a huge difference between IT and OT, where you focus on availability more so than uh, confidentiality. And then you've got your threats. So everything from script kitties to nation states. So the core metaphor in the middle is there's a circle with a TCA in the middle. That stands for task critical asset. There's a secret list that uh, the Navy really, really cares about these buildings. Well, an adversary is not going to spend $2 million trying to attack that building. Why don't you just attack the potable water or the comms or the backup power or the electricity, which is not secure? So was able to convey that uh, brief three different four stars. And from this visual, got 100 FTE, that is my command, along with $100 million in funding to go do that. Booked in the Palm 2016, $20 million a year. The power of the visual to explore, envision, execute, having a one-page document where you can articulate everything that you need to at an executive level, but you can also hit, if you want to go into policies for the back ventures, I can go down deep on CNSI 1253, which gives you the eight steps that are in the bottom right corner of how we actually do this. So it's linked to policy on what we're doing, and here's the programming that we need, if you need to go down that deep. Uh, but we have over 1,700 examples like this. I'm just giving you mine as a personal example as a client uh, and now running this company. This is the power of that visual. So I just want to pause there for at least questions in the room. Matt. Uh, you had said that start to finish it took uh, five months. 
uh, what was your estimate on what rework would have been required if this wasn't done? Uh, just because some would say just five months just to get the plan together is too long. So how would you negate that with uh, the return on investment if you didn't have this? Gotcha. So I would say, uh, I just remember the amount of socialization, the number of meetings I had to go to the Pentagon back and forth to convince people that this minus having this one pager, which again, went viral. So I would walk in offices in the Pentagon and it would be printed out in huge, like NAFAC's doing it, NAFAC's doing it. Like if you think of NAFAC, even though it's the oldest syscom, everybody thinks of NAVC who builds ships or NAV Air who builds airplanes. Everybody forgets about the civil mm -hmm. It's an afterthought. So that elevated that. But if I didn't have this, I'd be on PowerPoint decks with graphics. Uh, so a, a 50 page PowerPoint slide deck with palm bar charts of here's what we need, this is what we booked, here's the why, here's the decision point, do you approve, disapprove? Like that's not compelling. This, when I briefed this to two uh, four stars, the Fleet Forces Command four star and the Pack Fleet four star, I did it in a minute and two, 32 seconds. Oh. And then I stopped. And my two stars, like, we should say something, sir. Just, I got this. We paused, and then the four stars started talking to themselves. They started, hey, didn't we, weren't we supposed to book some money in the budget for the facilities replacement at this? They were having a conversation. And then they came back to me and said, well, Brandon, how do we fix this? Well, I'm glad you asked, sir. We've got an eight-step process. We're going to do this risk management framework program. If we're able to get the FTEs, here's how we're going to report back to you from a metric standpoint of how we're going to secure all of our facilities. And we're going to prioritize them based on this other command's top priority list. So I shut up again. They're like, we need to do this. But it's, again, the power of the visual, which... In my opinion, can't be done via PowerPoint in order to affect something like this. Any other questions? The tool of choice? So it, it's what our company does. So the question was, what was the tool of choice to create this? So we've got content strategists, design strategists, digital strategists, that for me as the client, I had a vision but I only draw stick figures. So I need people to like put certain things. Like I, I, I can build a PowerPoint deck in my, in my mind of, I want this to go here. I want this to go here. I need to convey this first, second, third. So as I'm speaking, they're graphically putting things where they need. And then we iterate it. So it's a co-creation type of process in order to produce this final delivery. Sir. So it, it was a big, it was a big printout when I took it in. Uh, and then I did leave behinds for everybody at the table. And then after that, even after I got my approval and the funding, this was my first PowerPoint slide. This, this became my title slide. Every, and then I had each one of these broken down into, so I, I could do a PowerPoint deck of this separate but it became kind of the moniker and the branding of this is who we are, this is what we do, this is our mission. When did you first learn the power of the boss? <laughs> Through Toastmasters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, and I think when you, you know, when you look at the, the project management framework, using this type of approach and it is a lot of work and i know that it, it can seem like hey you're you're slowing down to take a lot of time to get through kind of those first two steps but when the issue isn't finding a solution to the problem it's defining what the problem even is in the first place and getting alignment around that because you need cooperation across the whole system or a whole department to solve it uh, that type of work can be essential um so if that was like a very large scale kind of macro, hey, we don't even know what the problem is. How do we help wrap our heads around even what a solution could look like perspective? Um, here's another place where similar kind of techniques of that 
creative iterative iterative approach and a real focus on kind of empathy in the user up front, um, but to solve a very micro, very specific problem. So everybody got ring doorbells in like 2015, 2014. One of the unforeseen impacts of that was the postal service started getting a bunch of calls and angry messages about postal workers throwing packages because all of a sudden they were on camera getting caught throwing packages on people's doorways. And at the time, we were working um, with the chief kind of culture officer and customer officer within the postal service. And so in a lot of like communications type of roles and campaigns. So we were kind of brought in, okay, we need to run a change management campaign to convince, you know, to discipline these, these postal workers and have them know that they need to uphold, you know, our, our, our brand. And, and it was going, they were coming in to ask for what was really a pretty like disciplinary approach to a communications campaign. And we were able to talk them into taking a more design thinking approach and saying, hey, let's let's figure out why this behavior is even happening in the first place from the postal worker's perspective. So the traditional communication methods, you know, top down and the platforms they're using just weren't working. So, you know, we said, hey, we don't know. And this this is tough, you know, and it's tough to convince clients of sometimes too, but we don't know exactly what is causing this. We want to go find out. And so what our team ran over the course of um, a few months was a nationwide set of focus groups, facilitated sessions, shadowing sessions, ride-alongs with postal workers, a whole research campaign across you know, the country to figure out, hey, what drives you as an employee? What's, what's really important to you? Not really even focused on why are you throwing packages, but just what, what gets you up every day and what came up time and time again and if anyone's worked with or around the Postal Service, fascinating organization, long history, first Postmaster General, that's very important. There you go. Um, and what, what came up time and time again in all these conversations was a sense of pride in the work, in the mission. You know, there's there's a mantra in the Postal Service of no matter rain nor sleet nor snow, we will get your package to your door. I'm paraphrasing the second part, the first line is right. And so this idea of pride in the work itself was just came up over and over again in in talking to the staff so we went back and said hey rather than focus on a campaign where the tagline would be don't throw packages <laughs> instead what if or you know you better not throw a package instead what if it was you know own your pride you know, kind of, you know, be, be prideful, be the good apple. Don't root out the bad apple, but be the good apple there. And so we created a whole campaign that was hashtag postal pride. And it started with a mail carrier centric campaign. It moved into, you know, a kind of back of the house or retail focus campaign, you know, and this was printed materials that were in every single post office back room in the country. Um, posters and communications sent to their actual like mail reader machines that they would get on the screen. So this touched, and I mean, we're talking, you know, tens of thousands of employees across the country, like this, the postal service is huge. And so this was all over the place. Hey, this campaign was how they were communicating to employees about it. And then more than that, it was the activation of how this ended up getting kind of owned with social media perspectives to it, with, um, you know, just kind of engagement from, boardroom levels, you know, from the sea levels of the Postal Service and HQ in DC to plants and um, carriers and processing plants around the country. Um, so really from, you know, offices out to out in the field and it was just completely owned by that facility. And they saw um, more than a 50% drop in complaints um, in the years following, you know, this this campaign out there. And more so it was the the ongoing, once we, we weren't even working anymore on this project and there were still posts, events, all of this happening with the hashtag, oh, by postal employees themselves. They really kind of took it on themselves and owned it. And so that idea of, we didn't know, Postal Crowd wasn't an idea when we pitched the project. It's, it's being able to go in and be creative by having the empathy to understand, okay, who's going to receive this? Even if receiving it isn't, uh, you know, CIO needing budget or the team you would hire, even if it's just a person or an audience receiving a message, what will it mean to them? What drives them as a human being, as a person? Um, and then using that as your primary design parameter when you're starting to plan out, okay, 
what should a project look like? How might we accomplish that? What, what will happen? Does anyone have any questions on that one before I move on to one more? Cool. So another, you know, and again, this is, these are by design um, a varied set of examples because this approach can be kind of applied across the, uh, you know, different fields and different worlds. So we talked about it from a strategy perspective, can talk about it from a communications perspective, from a technology perspective, uh, you know, the design thinking approach really does uh, dovetail quite nicely with human-centered design, user experience design, and the like. So um, with work at the US Air Force, when we're looking at doing digital transformation efforts on HR systems, you know, essentially, hey, how are we gonna move all of these uh, systems into the cloud and go through and, and roll out all these new applications? Um, traditionally, you know, it might be, hey, pick your SI. It's the biggest decision you have to make. But what's the work that can be done upfront before fingers ever hit a keyboard to code? to capture the voice of the user community, to do requirements gathering in a visual and collaborative way, to prototype and test uh, what solutions would look like so that when you hand something off to an engineer or a developer, the, they're so much farther along than they would be otherwise. And the end users and recipients of the technology they'll be getting have already seen it, had a say in it um, and impacted it. Not only does this lead to better solutions, um, there's almost change management as a byproduct of the process itself when you involve people this way in the, in the kind of creation of a solution. They feel informed just by the nature of gathering the information and they feel a sense of ownership um, in what's created. So when we went into work with uh, the A1, you know, we didn't start with requirements gathering, we started with ethnography. You know, it was, running focus groups, running, running surveys, surveys, doing, doing shadowing shadow folks um, uh, as they went about their daily lives and their daily jobs and, and, and seeing you know, how it is that they worked, how they interacted with the current systems themselves. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of on the whiteboard or on the virtual whiteboard. Um, how are we gonna transition from the process that a paper form is showing? How can we get people to draw out, even if it's just on paper in boxes and sticks, what a system could look like, how an application could work, mapping out those types of process flows. And so that when we're walking over to the SI and the developer, um, we're handing them, here's what it should look like. Here's what it should feel like. Here's what the experience should be like. Um, so that when fingers are hitting keyboard to code, which are also often your most expensive resources from a budget perspective that you're gonna do, they're not starting from scratch and it can just cut down a bunch of timeline costs. And you would talk. Let me just say one, one, one point to, to Nick's, and I'm gonna pull the thread on one thing that he just said. Um, so we do a lot of this human-centered design up front and you may think, you know, you know, why are we doing this? Like that's gonna take too much time. That's gonna delay our schedules. But the kind of the, my opinion, the future of work and how we do it, um, and 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 I've been the, the CIO that's delivered major systems and platforms. I've been the CIO that's fired SIs. I've been the CIO that's fired software companies because they couldn't deliver. And why couldn't they deliver? Because even from an agile process methodology, you're going to have an Excel spreadsheet. They're going to do user stories. And they're going to take those user stories and they're going to go take it to the developer. And the developer's in here in a black hole and they're going to come out with some code and it's going to be 60% MVP. And usually as the CIO, I'm delivering on behalf of the business and I bring my business partner in and they're like, I mean, this is not what we wanted and can you change this and can you change that? So to me, again, future of work, and what we're doing here. So if outside of pick the platform, I can design the screens because I've worked with the users to exactly what they want, the exact flow that they need. And then give that to the developer to do exactly this. I want the Salesforce service now screens to look just like this. I'm like, oh, cool, okay. I don't have to make it up from this user story. Who does that? all for. So we did all this upfront work and we kind of brought UAT, user acceptance testing, to the beginning of the process. Now you're actually delivering something somebody wants. 
and can use. So instant user adoption, increased MVPs, shortened implementation time. And, and my, my thought is for us to come in with an SI, we don't do what the SI does, we do this. Now the client's gonna be so happy, oh, can you do this on this platform? Do it again, not drag out. You told me you were gonna implement it in 12 months. It's taken 36 months and we're still not close and I'm still paying you. Why? But you're stuck, you're too far into it. So the future of work, in my opinion, is let's visualize exactly what we want with the user input so everybody's happy and why they get up. And hey, if you can design a screen where someone's passionate about what they do and then actually deliver that, that's a win-win all around, my opinion. So I think there's a lot of power in this and the power of design thinking and human-centered design and just kind of wanted to put stop that point. Something along those lines that's that's coming up a lot too. And you know, this this approach is really an outcome of a design thinking approach. But when you when you start to apply that human-centered design idea, and this is becoming more and more possible um, just in the market with solutions out there, is from a user's perspective, they may need to touch two, five, eight, ten enterprise systems in a day. Um, they don't care that they're touching 10 different systems. They're just trying to do their job. So when you get into user interface design, if you can elevate a level up and have a common design system across all those platforms, so they might not even know they're touching all those different systems in different ways, that starts to drive down training costs, adoption timelines uh, for those users just by the nature of the kind of visual design of what they're using themselves. So being able to look at it from that kind of UI UX layer that sits on top um, it is, is something that in the technology space is, is really interesting. And that, that's more along the kind of UX UI design front, but even taking that approach in the first place is an outcome of looking at this from a, from a design thinking approach. So the topic of today is like how, okay, how does this kind of align with specifically project planning and definition? We went through this exercise um, over the past couple of days trying to map like, okay, how would we take the different uh, steps of the design thinking framework and, and map it to the kind of project management framework? Um, it wasn't very easy, frankly. Uh, we've taken a whack and we'll kind of run through some ideas, but I don't think this is perfect. We would be interested in, in, in thoughts on it um, because I do think there is a little bit of conflict between you know the the kind of PMI approach of hey let's let's set everything up up front and follow the plan and the design thinking approach which essentially says that isn't going to be possible or you'll get better solutions if that isn't possible up front and you look at it but I think there's ways that they can work together very nicely and weave them together in certain ways so if you look at kind of the first step of you know conception and initiation that's really where the empathy is key and needs to needs to occur. So beyond the requirement, it's the user community, even if it's not a technology, whoever's gonna use this thing, whoever's gonna to touch it, whoever's gonna see it, whoever's gonna be triggered to an action from it, really understanding who they are from a process and function perspective, but more importantly, from a human perspective. They're, they're a person at the end of the day for now. And so let's let's make sure that they're, they're reacting to it. And understanding who they are. And then when project charters, when initial plans are put together, those are still essential and important, but being able to vet them against that user understanding is key and should just be a gut check. Does this make sense in the context of who it is we're talking to? Um, another kind of key part of these early phases would be, you know, as, as Brandon did in the NAPFAC example, paint the picture of what success looks like. So even as you navigate towards it, you may not know exactly the path you're gonna take. You may have to shift over time, but you know your destination, you know where you're going and you can better align to that general North Star. So in the second phase of, of definition and planning, um, again, that, that clear definition of success and of the North Star is key in terms of the definition phase. What's, what's really important in the design thinking approach and just kind of a creative approach to problem solving is to have that open ideation, you know, and I think it was, I was talking to one of you earlier and it was, hey, an ideation session is never the best use of time in the moment, 
but there's long-term ROI from it almost always. And so being willing to, it is, it's, it's, it's a little bit being proactive instead of reactive. It's a little bit willing to take that long-term bet um, in, in sacrifice of short-term productivity, but it pays off. Then when you look at timelines, scopes for different phases, if there is an ability to have ranges in those, that's, that can be really key. Uh, just in being able to still set expectations, but have the flexibility to pivot throughout execution and then plan for change and have mechanisms in place to really address that change. So you get into section, you know, steps three and four, launching projects and really going through a performance and control phase. That needs to be a cycle, just like the prototype and test cycle. Um, you know, the agile approach to software development and sprints there, the design thinking approach is a little bit like that but not for development, for everything else um, or any other type of work you're doing. So if you can bring in some of the structures related to sprints and retroactives um, in the work you're doing, that can be really um, effective. Having a regular cadence um, of forecasting and updates of that forecasting and showing that alignment to end success, the end vision, the North Star. And often, you know, uh, someone asks, like, what format did you show that map in? They're often used as a printout, but they're also really effective as throughout the life of a project, after that's the vision that's set, being used as an interface to surface different types of information, whether that's forecast data, whether that's links to other relevant documentation, to kind of imbue everything with that context of the overall strategic vision. And then as you close out a project, really just drive towards the fact that, hey, this is a way of thinking. It's, it is a, a bit of a, you know, outside the box way of working sometimes. And so you know, being able to capture those lessons learned and do consistent reporting based off of it. So one thing that comes up a lot uh, in my job and specifically in, in DC where you're doing a lot of government work is, okay, cool. You got to be flexible. You got to be willing to embrace the unknown. But how do you scope that? How do you contract that? Specifically in the government space is, is always a challenge. And so there's a couple different approaches we take. Some are more applicable in the commercial world. Some are more applicable in um, the government world. So in the commercial world, it's really about scoping by phase. So I often go in and I can estimate, you know, we can estimate based on a general need, hey, we have an order of magnitude of what a project may take, but all I can really price out for you right now is that first phase, that initial understanding, empathy, and ideation. At each phase along the way, I'm going to deliver a honed in proposal for the next step because I just don't know. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it costs today. I can tell you a range, but, you know, we're going to have to, to, to kind of cut across it um, because otherwise it's, it's, you're going to be, you're not going to end up with a creative solution if you're putting yourself in a box when you start. In the government one, do you want to talk to this one? The uh, Keep going. fleet forces example? All right, cool. So in um, government and DOD, where we found specifically with like very large complex programs. And so this is an example we're working on with part of the Navy that's all around, you know, supply chain of some pretty sensitive materials. And it's not a supply chain they can necessarily track. It falls across multiple systems commands. It falls across countless enterprise systems. It falls across the globe. Um, and it's a problem that nobody is in charge of fixing. Solely. So we get brought in and they're like, hey, fix this problem. Well, you don't even know what the problem is. How do you expect us to fix it? So uh, an approach we take here is essentially, if you look at the five steps of project management, we'll take those first two and that's the project. And you know, to your point, it's like, hey, that's five months to even get through the first two phases. When you're tackling something that big, hairy and complicated, that in and of itself um, is going to take months. It can take a year. And when you're talking, you know, these big, hairy problems, that's essential. Um, and so this, on this project, uh, specifically with the Navy, talking to our client early on, I was like, okay, what's, what's success for this phase? Is it, you know, a requirements document? Is it specs for an eventual system? And the answer was like, maybe, but frankly, the bigger outcome here is I want you to scare people. I want people to realize that this is a problem, similar to what you had happened in that of, hey, we need everyone to sit there and realize that we have no solution to this. And the only way we're gonna do that is by driving towards mutual empathy and understanding of how this problem could even begin to be solved. 
But so that's that's a key kind of way to look at it is splitting up what we would consider the five phases of one project and really saying, hey, the first two parts, the first two steps there are really a project in and of itself. From there, we'll come back to you with a clear definition, a scope for how you could fix it. If you want to take that to somebody else, that's fine. If you think we're a partner to work with on that, that's fine. But here's at least now you have a path forward. And then it's often the design to the definition of that problem of a solution. And then it's the implementation of that solution. And cutting that up into those parts is, is often the only way to approach it when something gets that complicated. Let me say one thing. Um, so back to the power of the pause, uh, it's okay that you don't know the outcome or how to fix it or the solution when you start. That's point number one. Um, point number two is it's not lost on me that acquisitions and culture don't necessarily align to this process. So that's not lost on me on that. However, there are a lot of examples that if you kind of be, get comfortable with the pause, go through the process, magic happens with this. So I want to I want to leave you with um, how we define value. And, I, and I'm going to say it twice, but I'm going to say our equation uh, once, and then I'm going to go through each of them. So in our mind, a through line, value equals dream outcome times likelihood divided by effort required times time delay. I'll say it again. Value equals dream outcome. Dream outcome is, if I were to say to you as an executive or a leader, how can I differentiate you in your seat so that you can do it different than anybody else that did it before you and you can achieve all the outcomes that your business, your goal, your mission, your agency is trying to achieve? How can I help you align a vision where everyone sees where they fit in? How can I help you work across the aisle with your colleagues such that they see, oh, wow, this, this is going to benefit me and you're enabling what I do. And how can I increase your MVPs, increase user adoption, and shorten your implementation timelines? Dream outcome. Likelihood. So whether that's your experience, your past performance, you've done this before, you can pull from examples. This exists. Dream outcome times likelihood divided by effort required. How many folks is it going to take to actually do this? Do I need to hire contractor support in order to do this? And then time delay. There are always going to be delays in every every uh, implementation. It just anything technical is, is going to have a delay. But can I shorten those? So dream outcome times likelihood divided by effort required times time delay equals the value. And I think from a PMI perspective, even whether it's a waterfall project or it's an agile project, you're still trying to provide value to whomever you're presenting this to, your your client, your 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 customer. It's our goal, our jobs to convey value or deliver value. So I say all that to say uh, we've got some innovative ways to do that. We believe our process from an explore, envision, execute. Um, lens lends itself to producing outcomes that are impactful. So with that, I think we'll take questions. Hello. Or we can exit Becky. stage left. Hello, <laughs> this is Becky. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello. I guess so. Got it. So, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. So, question is about empathy, and uh, if let's say we're facilitating a workshop, and we've got different personalities within that group who may not agree, uh, how do we bring those folks together? So, I've seen this many times, and, and uh, I'm sure that there's a whole lot of disco Myers Briggs personality types within this room today, and we couldn't all agree possibly that that tablecloth is tan. Maybe it's brown or 
<laughs> goal, goal. So with that, it, it's, it's our experience that kind of peeling back the onion, I don't necessarily need you to agree or come to consensus, but I really need you to buy into your part of the process and you're making this end thing and you're a part of it. You can say, yeah, I helped to build that. So if I can get you to buy into that, we're not going to agree on everything, but because you're part of the process and, and a lot of government um, people aren't informed. There, there isn't a transparency. There's not empathy or vulnerability in the leadership. So therefore they, they don't feel like I've ever been involved in anything. So they just gonna, I'm gonna sit in my corner, I'm gonna do what I do. I'm gonna do it at my speed and that's it. But if I actually kind of to the postal crowd situation, if I get to the root of why you wake up and come to this job when you have a choice to go anywhere else, then now I'm really getting to the core. And again, we don't all have to agree on what the outcome is, but I'd, I'd, I'd offer that when folks know that they built something, they were part of the process, then that's how you diffuse that. To that, to that point too, at the end, it's, it's as much the involvement sometimes to get, and, and people can feel empathized with if they are asked, if they're listened to, regardless if what they say is used in the conversation sometimes, as long as they feel heard. Um, and, you know, pretty much everybody's used to working in some sort of hierarchical organization. They know a decision is going to be made, but when they feel that they have been asked, they have been listened to, and it wasn't just lip service, then um, they come to terms more with conflicts of error. Yeah. Where are the five states? So, so the question was, throughout these five phases, where would requirements analysis take place? And I would say it is initially happening a little bit in the defined phase and then mostly in between ID and prototype and then vetted in the testing phase. And this, those last kind of three phases, honestly, are really a cycle that get repeated. Um, and so I would say in terms of, you know, where, where those requirements really come out, it's, uh, it's, it's at the latter kind of half of this flow because that's what you're, you're prototyping around those specific requirements and then testing those prototypes with user communities to kind of, you know, analyze and vet whether they're valid and right. So I'd be my answer to that question. Uh, one question on chat, is there an agile approach for design thinking? I, I would say that design thinking is an agile approach kind of, but that would be my answer to that question without having gone to school for it. Um, so I think short answer is yes. Um, we operate in a sprint model. We showed you how we scope things. So we've got this uh, concept of design tokens, which really equals 80 hours of work. So uh, uh, story points, uh, so it's a sprint. And then we're able to kind of iterate and ideate and prototype and kind of move in these cycles. So it is really the definition of being agile because we don't know the end, but we're gonna be flexible in the process. And we know through this cycle of this rinse and repeat that we're gonna come out to, okay, what actually does this prototype work? What is this prototype? Or do we need to match these three together? So it's, it's really the definition of the agile process. Uh, next question, how do you make sure you have the right stakeholders for each phase? Uh, especially some really effective change. So out of a five or a seven month uh, design thinking contract or hours or what your setup is, you provide an example of like when you had a change of leadership, that you have to start from square one. Sure. Um, so, so the question is with shifting, um, it's in the chat as well, but it would shifting leadership, um, you know, and over kind of a, a longer time period, how do you make sure you get the right 
stakeholders involved. So a um, couple answers to that question. One, first part is that the process isn't always long to kind of set those requirements. Some of the examples we shared where it takes a long time are kind of like massive uh, programmatic level issues when you're dealing with more kind of like point pain points or, or point solutions, it can be quicker. Um, getting the right stakeholders involved is always a challenge. And that in and of itself is an iterative process uh, because often it is, hey, all you need to do is talk to my team. And it's through the kind of reframing of questions, looking at it in different ways that often is the, the value of bringing in a more, let's say, creative background um, to a more traditional consulting role. Um, you know, you get different questions about how to structure a system when the person asking you those questions is trained as a architect or an industrial designer and not as a developer. Um, and when you try and answer those questions in different ways, you realize I don't have a good answer to that and who might and who does. So often you need to involve different people when leadership shifts, I think that's where the spin on to, to kind of the question of when there's conflict and, and empathy, um, how, how do you rationalize that? There's a difference between understanding kind of an organization or a stakeholder group and then acting on that understanding. And so while a leadership shift might change kind of the, the acting on the information set that you've gathered, that information set, especially in um, you know, long-term established organizations, doesn't change so rapidly that it that it changes overnight or changes with the leadership shift. So often that kind of base level cultural understanding um, is still valid. You're just putting a different spin on it. So there's definitely work to be done to apply it to that new stakeholder or that new leader, but you don't have to throw out all the work you've done um, kind of in the background. Okay, on that one. one quick, um, so I would, I don't know how everybody else in the, in the room is, but I, I remember coming up and getting mentored and it, there's a lot of power in socialization. So I'm one that likes to socialize things to get a read from various people across cross-functional different organizations, uh, all within the organization, just so when it comes to prime time, it's not the first time everybody's seeing this and folks have kind of had a buy-in. So uh, give you an example, I'm giving a brief to our entire organization tomorrow and it's 80 people, but I've brief, pre-briefed this thing 13 times prior to tomorrow's brief. So I would say from a stakeholder perspective, it's like whoever the leader is, you know, you got to have the vision. So, and if that leader who had the vision leaves, somebody still has to have that vision in order to kind of carry the water between, uh, unless, you know, it's the agency's mission and vision, but Whoever has the vision to do what I did from a OT perspective in cybersecurity of facilities, if I were to leave, then my deputy would have been the one because they were like, yeah, this, this is our vision. So usually you get people to buy into the vision and then you don't have a problem kind of getting the stakeholders, even if leadership changes. Uh, but that's something that we kind of get up front through the doing the emphasize, uh, em empathize and, and defining what the problem is. Any more questions? How long ago was the project? How would they make them the success of your project? Postal Proud was run, I think, 2015 through 2017 um, was the original project. Um, they were, they had gala in house for a lot of like, in, like surveys of employee. Um, monitoring and then I forget exactly the data source that was tracking kind of their complaints from them. It might have been some some NPS work as well um, that they were doing. I don't know the specific answer to that question for today uh, because we're not working with that organization, that part of the organization as well. There's thousands of professional services firms out there. Like how many design thinking firms? Like what's your competitive space in terms of the market, at least stateside? Yeah, I would say, um, so the, the question is, there's there's tons of professional services and consulting firms. How many design thinking firms are there? Like, what is our competitive set like? I would say that, um, one, we use design thinking as a technique or tool, but I wouldn't necessarily call that our, like, 
foundational um, thesis or philosophy. I would say that's more centered around the idea of like enterprise design more broadly that like, hey, you can apply a design approach to all sorts of problems and visual communication um, and, and visualizing complexity is, is really our kind of sweet spot. Um, I would say we're, we're in an interesting little niche because, um, and I can still say this, that's awesome, even though you're CEO, um, we were the only design agency, creative agency I know that was founded by a CIO. So the idea of using brand strategy, creative approaches, super visual, you know, comms, a bunch of different formats, super common in advertising, marketing, uh, consumer facing roles. Um, it is a super valuable approach to communication, change management, figuring out a problem that's pigeonholed there. And we have always kind of approached it from, I work with a bunch of people in an office that looks like a marketing agency that's selling Pepsi to you on a commercial at the Super Bowl, but we're selling a digital transformation to a CIO office within the military. So that kind of overlap of technical understanding with the creative approach is pretty small. Um, I would say other companies that kind of, you know, are bigger than us in this space that have been around for as long or longer, you know, there's the IDOs and the x A lot of the great ones have been gobbled up over the years um, by large consultancies. Um, and they sometimes, uh, you know, go gobble them up. So like Fjord over at Accenture, um, Adaptive Path of Capital One. Um, a lot of those those kind of companies have, have gotten gobbled up over the years. So from a boutique perspective, um, in the markets we play in, there's there's not a ton. Um, and frankly, we see ourselves as a, as a complement to kind of a lot of the other types of professional services firms that play in the same space. We can be a catalyst to multiplier effects. We team a lot with big consulting companies. And I like to say like, hey, you guys are the chicken and the potatoes and the broccoli or the salt. I'm looking for 1% of your budget. I'm just going to make it taste a lot better and uh, pop off the plate. My question is, I know you made a decision not to go to the rules, but how much did you have, how much did you need to do to the or down the south of what you have in the very beginning. And how many sort of like goals are in mind? To be honest with you, actually, all of these components existed when we started. Um, so all the instructions are there. That came from uh, another sister system organization. Those are our technical authority, which we had an instruction on, and this is what we do. The top right is the risk management framework. Uh, this bottom piece comes from this particular instruction right here, the CNSSI 1253. It's the eight-step process. So it, it was my job not to reinvent the wheel. I just needed to take all the information and convey it in a way that made people pay attention to it. So I would say, and, and a lot of the projects, so some, sometimes we're working with the Navy now and they need to figure out ordinance. So how to get missiles and munitions to ships and planes. The solution's not there up front, but in certain cases, it's really about piecing together and telling a story in a way. So for the ordinance example, we're gonna to piece together some, some issues in order to get the funding, in order to figure out a solution. Um, but in this case, all of it existed. So everyone knew that the, we had this huge contract and Matt, you remember this AMI uh, automated metering initiative where these three companies were putting these meters that were connected to the Wi-Fi on every Navy building across the globe. We knew they had Wi-Fi on them. Just nobody thought to, oh, well, how are we securing these? And they didn't acquisition for the security of said meters. They just were trying to roll the meters out for this initiative. So yeah, in this example, all of this information existed up front. It was just how you tell the story, how you display the story visually together to achieve an outcome. Yep. So um, that was a great client answer. Can you are a client in this case? And that's what every client says. 
Um, I have my story. I just need you to make a picture of it. I just need you to help me tell it. Um, you're, you were right in this case, you did 25% uh, of the time. That's true. Everyone thinks it's true. Everyone says, I know my story. I just need you to help tell it. Once, especially once you visualize it and you start to see how the different parts connect and you start to say, okay, how do these parts interact? I don't know. Well, what's the connection here? Oh, I don't know. What should we fill out this part of it with? I don't know what those are. So there is a certain level, I would say, um, in the delivery specifically of these types of holistic visual of a vision of a strategy of a program of a, of a process where um, by moving it from words to pictures, um, it, there's a gap identification kind of exercise or a redundancy identification exercise uh, that happens as you go through that. Um, so yes, it happens. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but rare. <laughs> Sometimes too. Yeah. Uh, so, would you say that in like, graphics, when you tell more information, you want visual to be able to create a story as to how the problem will act? So, would that be also kind of like graphics display more information? Yeah, so the, so the question is like, hey, is that more like a, a infographic approach, like this this type of thing? And I would say yes, this is a a uh, a large scale infographic, and we often try and you know kind of take that approach of you know infographics are super valuable and super popular because they get complex topics across and understood pretty quickly by audiences. So that's why they're so popular in news. That's why they're so popular in social media and other fields. And so being able to do so is essential. But one, one thing that I'll highlight real quick um, is often you tell a story or create an infographic by crafting a picture of, let's say, your strategy or your organization. So here's another example that we did for um, CISA, their cybersecurity strategy, post cyber executive order and big expansion of um, authority and responsibility. So you create a picture to tell a certain story that picture can be super valuable to tell a bunch of other stories mm -hmm. as well. Because we created a picture of your organization and what it's doing. So often while we'll create, you know, a graphic to tell a certain story to a certain audience or to get across a certain concept to a certain audience, that yeah. picture can then That's be nice. used as a bit more of an interface to surface different types of information. So there's no. versions of this no. same oh, like nice. graphic where instead of showing like. current state, future state information, it's showing it's data well, related to progress against these initiatives or linking the core documents related to how so these things are. And, and so when you start to get into, yes, it's an infographic, that same graphic can then be used for multiple focus. purposes. Oh, like you They see some some cool like value out of some of this uh, visualization. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that was it. A great presentation I think really showcases what the future of project management is. And over the course of years and decades, those solutions will be more affordable. Uh, but uh, still, the money that can be saved on doing that up front, uh, I think is instrumental to the overall project and avoiding rework. Uh, so we'll turn it over to closing comments from our uh, incoming chapter president, Mr. Geis. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, we uh, did a number crunching, and we're going to uh, going on the future. Uh, we're going to cut five dollars from the dinner meetings. So, and uh, you know that, that's 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 the big com comment to make. But um, let's see. Our next meeting will be May third, and um, hope to see you then and you know, live and prosper. What can I say? Right? But what's that?
Yeah, five dollars for a member. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, please uh, drive carefully. Okay.